that need a fresh oil that comes from above, a fresh oil that comes from heaven. So we're, we're in a series talking about oil carriers, oil carriers, and what it means to be anointed. Because I believe there's a lot of people that know scripture, that go to church, but my question is, do you carry oil? Do you carry oil on your life and in your life? Okay, that oil is a representation of what? The Holy Spirit, okay? The mark of God, the presence of God. We can't do anything without the anointing of God. Now, we don't idolize the anointing. We love Jesus, and it is the Holy One, according to the epistles of John, that gives us this anointing. That's what the Word of God says. So we're here to be able to get empowered by the Holy Spirit, and you can't do anything without the anointing. It doesn't matter how much Bible scripture you know. We talk a lot about Pharisees and legalism and people that were even condemning Jesus and, and starting to stop his ministry. But it was the power of the Holy Spirit that allows us to move in these last days. You need the mark of God. You need the presence of God. You need the anointing in your life to empower you and activate who God created you to be. It is the anointing that allows us to move because God has an original design for us. To operate at the function and the level that he has called us for in the marketplace. That's the anointing of God. That's carrying the oil. So when we're talking about oil carriers, I'm talking about something that can only come from heaven. You're anointed to be a prayer, prayer warrior. You're anointed to pray. You're anointed to be able to share with boldness. You're anointed to the point where you could just smile at somebody and, the, and God's glow, the Chicana glory just shines through that person. Because the transformation that God has through you is that transformation that you can transfer onto others. That's the presence of God. That's the glow of God. I'm not fake. I'm not trying to just fake it because I believe we're pursuing happiness. That's what the world wants us to do. It's not, it's okay to be happy. But happiness is, is it's just temporary. Joy. Joy. That's eternal. Happiness can come from everything of this world, but joy can only come from God. Joy. There was something I heard from someone, and it was such a, it was a good revelation. It wasn't my revelation, but I believe it was birthed from the Holy Spirit. And it said, how come if the angels, their job was to be able to just praise and glorify the king all the days of their life, forever, how come a third of the angels got deceived? How come a third of the angels left and got deceived? But, but it was their job that, that allowed them to do what they had to do to be able to just praise God. How could you be in a, in, a glory, in a place of glory just praising the king in his presence? That was your job. That was the angel's job. And a third of them got deceived. But that was the issue. It's because they made it their job, not their joy. So when you think of ministry as just a job, I'm, I'm a clock-in Christian. I'm clocking in just to look like this, just to try to be the part. But I, when I have joy of serving God, when I have the joy of loving Christ, when I have the joy of praying for others, when I have the joy, it becomes so different. When you see ministry as a job, it might rob you of your joy. I'm not a nine-to-five Christian. I'm a lay my life down, deny myself, picking up the cross and following Jesus daily type of Christian. Let me just share. It ain't easy. It's not easy. And that's why we're talking about oil today. Here's the word if you guys want to tag this, this, uh, this teaching today. How anointing attracts attacks. How anointing attracts attacks. Like the level of warfare that's coming in your life is because of the level of calling and pressing and crushing and purifying and sanctification and consecration that's, that's taking place. And people be like, that's not in the Bible. I'm about to show y'all. Because I love the word of God. I love to be able to take scripture and make it relevant to what's going on today in our life. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 5. We're going to talk about David. 2 Samuel chapter 5. Now, let me share something about this. David was a man after God's heart. And even though David wasn't invited to the anointing party, the anointing party came to him. All his other brothers were lined up while he was a shepherd. And I think this is something we need to understand that we're not chasing the anointing. We chase Jesus. 
It says, when I follow the shepherd, the great I am, right? Psalm 23, that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I chase Jesus and everything else chases me. But it is a heart of worship that God wants. Not a heart, heart of, of clout. Not trying to just chase the things that are vanity. Now, this is where discipleship is us unlearning. But discipleship is also understanding my assignment. Like when you know your assignment, you're not just going to start chasing anything. Like I'm going to tell you, I'm not chasing things. Things just supernaturally come. But also, when God is sending something, doesn't the enemy also send a counterfeit? When, when God is sending something, doesn't the gates of hell also send something? So that's what discipleship is. It's discernment. That everything that looks like an increase does, isn't always from God. Bible all day, Matthew chapter 4 the devil tempted Jesus with an increase. If you just bow down to me, I'm going to give you everything. If it, if it compromises the, cry, the cross, that Jesus, what Jesus did, it might be a counterfeit. Not everything. I'll tell y'all, demons are attached to money. Demons have titles. Demons have resources. Okay? So this isn't if it's just an increase. It's looking like a good thing, but is it a God thing? 2 Samuel chapter 5, where this is, the, this is the story of David. Verse 17, it says this. Now when the Philistines, we're in verse 17, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Now when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king of, over, all, over Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. When you get anointed and the enemy hears, he's coming after you. Anointing attracts attacks. When the Philistines heard that David got anointed king over Israel, they sent to come after David. Anointing attracts attacks. But here's, here's what we need to know. I need to hear in the spirit what's really going on. David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Verse 18, then the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of Facebook. David asked his spouse. Oh, no. David asked his bestie. Oh, no. David asked his, okay, David inquired of the Lord. This is what's interesting, that when the enemy's attacking, we start to ask dysfunctional friends and besties that just came from happy hour. Right? Like, why do we as kingdom people inquire worldly people for a spiritual battle if the battle is not flesh and blood? So what do you think about this? And then it's like, it's so, it's so much dysfunction being birthed when the war plan, the game plan, the war map, the strategy comes from heaven. So David, verse 19, and here's, here's what I'm going to tell y'all. The more you read about David's life, the more you're going to see the words in the same sentence, David inquired of the Lord. All throughout his, his, his teaching and all throughout the Bible when they mention David, David inquired of the Lord. Saying, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. So David went to Baal, Perazim. And David defeated them there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. Breakthroughs, breakthroughs. When you inquire of the Lord, there will be breakthroughs. But if oil needs to be squeezed out of an olive, there also needs to be a pressing so that the squeezing comes out. So that oil can come out. And that's what's so interesting that when you squeeze anything, whatever is inside of you, that's what's going to squeeze out, be squeezed out in pressure. Anger, anger. Frustration, frustration. So we have to deal with these things, give it to the Lord so that when I do get pressed and squeezed, it's me praising God. It's me having joy. It's me pulling my strength from the king. The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, he called the name of that place Baal Perazim. I, I, I heard this a few weeks ago in the spirit 
What if the breakthrough is the break you? What if the breakthrough is the break you? What if you've idolized way too many things in this world and God is breaking the idolatry over your life? That marriage was an idol. That bank account, it was an idol. That friendship, it was an idol. That employer, it was an idol. Everything becomes a source. And it's, it's so simple for us to say, God, I trust in you. Until some shaking happens. That's where the testing happens. And I'm going to stand before y'all humbly. That, that's happened to me a lot. We're like, Lord, I trust you. And then I get the private pressing. And it's like, do I really trust God? The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water. Therefore, we call the name the place Baal Perazim. Verse 21, and they left their images there. And David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Uh-oh, here they come again. After the enemy has defeated, been defeated, they will also deploy themselves to position to still attack you. Okay? That's what the Philistines just did. We got defeated, but we're not done. And sometimes we defeat devils, but they got, they got cousins. They got cousins. They got bros. They got sisters. They got tribes that are going to come. If anger doesn't come, what's going to come? Another spirit of murder is going to come. Frustration is going to come. Anxiety is going to come. Fear is going to come. These, these people, they, these spirits, they come with homies. They, 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 they're in gangs, y'all. Right? Remember that spirit that when, the, when, when, when a, a temple gets swept, when a household gets swept, swept clean and it doesn't get filled with anything and it's just empty, that wicked spirit that, that leaves and it comes back, it will come back with seven more homies stronger than it was in before. That's why we got to get filled up daily. You got delivered at the altar five years ago. But are you filling yourself up with God's word today? Fill your mind up with God's word so that the devil doesn't have any room for his lies. You're gonna be filled up with one or the other, okay? And again, they deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord. He didn't even say, oh, well, I could do this again, right? I got this. He, he, he went back to ask God, and God said, you shall not go up. Circle around them and come upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. So. When he inquired God, God said, hey, the way that you defeated them the first time isn't going to be the same strategy the second time. How many of us are trying to fight a devil with old oil, a past prayer life, a past fasting life, right? And here's the thing. Praise God, because that, that, that fast, that prayer that you did in that season, it prepared you for another season. This is a new enemy. Same ancient spirit, different strategies. And what did God say? You're not going to go up again. You're going to circle around behind them and kind of come, come upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. Verse 24, and it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, then you shall advance quickly. For then the Lord will go out before you to strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. And he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. Let me just tell y'all church strategies that you've learned in your early seasons aren't going to be the same strategies because it's, it's churchy. It's religious rhetoric. It's just saying things, but there's no, there's no weight behind the word that is relevant to the season you're in today. So you need a fresh word, a fresh rema. You need a fresh oil. You need a fresh strategy that God breathe over whatever you're warring against today, right now. It needs to be a new strategy, and God's hand needs to be upon it. And here's the thing. If you feel like the enemy is taking dominion in certain areas of your life, what God is teaching us, if David, and David did so, verse 25, and the Lord commanded him, and he drove back the Philistines from Geba as far as Gezer. What does this mean? I got to take authority. I got to drive back the enemy, and I got to take dominion. I got to take territory. I got to drive them back from what they were initially trying to get. So if the enemy's taking dominion in your marriage, if the enemy's taking dominion in your finances, if the enemy's taking dominion in your mind, you need an, an, an inquire of the Lord to get strategy to drive them back. Anxiety, fear. You need a strategy to drive the enemy back. And only God can give that strategy. Only the Lord. While we're here in Samuel, let's go to chapter 11. And I'm only going to share this I love sharing this verse because 
it is us being able to discern seasons. Discern seasons in this in this season. Second Samuel chapter eleven. Context for y'all. David sees Bathsheba with no clothes, and he commits murder, fornication, adultery, right? All in one, all in one swoop. This is a king, y'all. Today we call these we if people if 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 somebody fell short of this, we call them false teachers. So y'all could go call David a false teacher for falling short. But here's what we need to discern today. Do they have a real heart of repentance for their falling? Because we love to nail people on, on, their, on that cross, but how about the, the private sins that you're committing today? What if the world saw that, right? None of us are perfect. So this is David. This is what I'm about to show y'all, what, what, what he's about to go into. But, and he has a whole psalm. I think it's what, Psalm 51 on this repentance prayer with what he did with Bathsheba. And between them two, what happened? It was Solomon that came through that bloodline. So a blessing did still come through that. God can turn it around. But you'll also see the generational curse on Solomon's life. That's a whole nother teaching right there. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. This was a season during the time when kings need to go out to battle. But David did not go out to battle. So the revelation behind this is that when kings are not in position, when God's children are not in position, temptation might be knocking at your door. David didn't go to battle when it was a time for kings to go to battle, so he fell short because of the temptation of what happened between him and Bathsheba. Now, God will take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around. Real repentance, real restoration, the difference between Solomon and David. Solomon, he was known as the one that had all the wisdom. David was known as what? A worshiper. So I believe God is raising up in this hour real, true worshipers, men and women of God that can worship him in spirit and in truth. Not just someone going to church, not just somebody that just knows a Bible verse. These are all great parts of a Christian walk, but someone that can worship him from the bottom of their heart. That if I can give God my heart, I will have access to what's in his hand. This is the power of a true worshiper, even though they're not perfect. John 17. John chapter 17. How anointing attracts attacks. How anointing attracts attacks. Last week, we talked about the power of prayer. And where is the most powerful place to pray to usher the presence of God? Today, as we're talking about this in John 17, this is Jesus praying for the disciples. So Jesus prays for himself. Then Jesus prays for the disciples. Then Jesus prays for all the believers. And, and, and what's amazing is if Jesus had to pray for himself, we also got to pray for ourselves. Okay, it's not selfish to just pray for yourself. Sometimes you just got to pray for yourself. Lord, cover me, guide me, lead my footsteps, right? And then you'll be led to pray for others. Where I'm going to sit here is, is, is John 17, 17. And it says this. It says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This is Jesus praying for his disciples. And this is the words of Jesus. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. We're talking a lot about sanctification in this season and how God wants us to consecrate and sanctify ourselves for these next 30 days, this next month as a ministry. And if you guys are part of that and you're called to fast and sanctify yourselves, what is that sanctification? There's, there's different ways to sanctify, but one of the main things is to be able to separate ourselves from the worldly things. If you listen to, to worldly music, sanctify yourselves for these next few days. If you listen to worldly artists, sanctify yourselves for these next few days. 
uh, definition in the Greek, because I love to study the Greek, it's to separate from profane things and dedicate it to God and dedicate your life to God. Separate yourself from the, the things of this world and dedicate it to God. Again, this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message so that we can get right. Like, how do you continue to beg God to heal you, but you're still sleeping with a devil that is hurting you? And then we blame God when literally you're still sleeping with the devil. It doesn't work like that. Sanctification is needed so that we can walk in, in, in true righteousness and holiness and reverence, respect, so we can have eyes that actually see. Eyes that see. To sanctify, it means to purify, to, to cleanse externally. It's to, to also free from the guilt and the shame. To free from the guilt and the sin. Because that's what the enemy does. Well, you're still doing this. Great. The blood of Jesus is activated over your life. The power of God that can empower you to overcome the sin. No matter what you've been through. You went through a divorce, the blood of Jesus be upon that. Let God restore what the swarming locust, the eating locust, the consuming locust has tried to take. Whatever it is, let the blood of Jesus wash that clean sanctification to pur purify externally but also to to purify internally what is that internally it, the renewing of the soul the mind the will the emotions i think some of us in here need, we need to forgive you need to forgive your dad that wasn't there you need to forgive your mom that continues to backlash you everything you say they just d disagree with you and sometimes it's us forgiving ourselves and then forgiving them I actually had to learn in this last season to forgive myself. I didn't even know I had to forgive myself. But you know what, you know what that, that forgiveness of myself was? It was because I was getting convicted of guilt, of shame, of certain things that I've done in a past season, in a season where I was sharing God's word that I was guilty of, that, that the shame, but I had to forgive myself. And I think we have to forgive ourselves because we're so, we're so pu putting at everybody else. It starts with us. It starts with our heart, forgiving yourself, forgiving yourself. I'm gonna read this one more time, John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. That's what God's word does to us. It is truth. Go to Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three, we're talking about the oil. We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. The oil, the oil, the oil, the power of God and the Lord's oil. In Matthew chapter 3, I'm going to go from verse 13, okay? I'm going to show you guys more Bible verses, more Bible verses that shows that anointing attracts attack. Even Jesus needed the Spirit of God. The, the anointing is the Spirit of God. Even Jesus needed the Spirit of God. The anointing is not how much Bible verses you've, you've, you've memorized. That's not the anointing. That's called head knowledge. We're not looking at head posture. We're looking at heart posture. This is how God can fill this place up, this, th this temple up. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus is getting baptized. Jesus is getting baptized, not just physically with water, but he's also getting baptized in the spirit. That is why we call him John the Baptist, the baptizer that baptized Jesus himself. Matthew 3, 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And are you coming to me? This is how humble John the Baptist is. He's like, Lord, you need to baptize me. <laughs> Verse 14, but Jesus answered and said to him, permit it be, be so now. For thus it is, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Verse 16, when Jesus had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Here comes the presence of God, the spirit of God, the mark of God, the anointing of God, even over Jesus himself. If Jesus had to get the mark of God, so do we. And behold, the heavens were open to Jesus, and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I love this because right after Jesus got baptized in the Jordan, he didn't just go launch and do deliverance right away. What happened? He went into the wilderness and got tempted 
by the devil. After he got the anointing ceremony take place on his life publicly, he went straight into the wilderness and got tempted by the devil 40 days. The scripture doesn't say that there was three major temptations. Yes, there were three major temptations that were recorded. But if you read this in Luke chapter 4, Jesus was get, getting tempted every day. Who knew that when David got anointed as a shepherd boy, that for the next decade, a demonic leader and king would be coming after him to kill him? King Saul. Who knew that an anointing would come with an attack on my life? If we all knew that, we'd probably say no to God. Because we see the attacks that are coming after your marriage, your household. But there is no demon. There is no principality. There is no power that is greater than the anointing that is in you and on you. Than the power of God that is being released. There is nothing that is greater than Jesus. Because he is the head of all principalities, of powers, above all. And that's what God is testing, our faith in him, our trust in him. Are we giving him this situation truly? But Lord, my future is not how it used to be because I was so comfortable in this situation. I was so comfortable with this connection. I was so comfortable. But God is testing your heart to see, do you really trust in me or did you trust in man and what man can give? God is testing his children and it's only going to sharpen you. It's only going to make you better. It's only going to get you stronger for where the Lord has to take you. A lot of pressing in this past season for me, but a lot of strength, a lot of glory was birthed through that. And remember, whatever you squeeze out of that thing is what is going to come out. So the Holy Spirit, I, I once heard that the Holy Spirit is in you for you, but the Holy Spirit is on you for others. May people see the Holy Spirit on you so they can be touched. But may you be empowered and, and allow the activation of the anointing, the Holy Spirit, the glory of God, may it be in you for you. The anointing doesn't just come with attacks. The anointing also comes with assignments. There is an assignment on your life when you are marked with the presence of God. Jesus had an assignment to do what he had to do to preach to the multitudes, to be able to heal the sick, to allow blind people to see. And that's what the Isaiah verse is, right? The, 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 the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. It has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to let the oppressed be set free. That is the anointing and the power of God on our life. And that's what, what can happen with us. Go to Acts chapter four. What's amazing too is in, in, in Luke, it says this, that after the devil did every temptation he could, the devil would come at, at an opportune time. That's, that's, in, that's in Luke. That is, that is in Luke where it says, where the devil will come at an opportune time. Acts chapter 4. These are men that are bold. Right, Peter, the, the apostle, the leader of, one of the leaders of the, the New Testament in the book of Acts Church. This is, this is Peter and them looking at them. They were just bold and they were telling, they were saying, hey, we forbid the name of Jesus in this place. We forbid that. Why do you forbid it? Because there's power in it, right? If it didn't cause a threat or if there was no power, we wouldn't be forbidding this. So Acts 4.13, they just did a miracle. And what happened? Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, okay, these were the religious leaders. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But that when they had commanded them to go aside outside of the council, they conferred among themselves. Verse 16 saying, what shall we do with these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem and we cannot deny it. There's going to be so many miracles in our life that even the naysayers couldn't even deny what God is doing. Verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them. That's what the enemy does. He, he, he'll threaten you to not be bold. He'll threaten you 
so that you can't get up. Come on, some of us, there's some days where it's hard to get up because I'm so consumed with so much stuff. So the enemy will send threats that become thoughts in our mind. So what do they do? They let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. 19, but, but God, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. <laughs> For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go. See, they still, even though they were still bold, they will, the enemy will still threaten you and then loosen you and then let you go. Let, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people since they all glorified God for what they had done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle, this miracle of healing had been performed. Just as like wickedness is abound, the Bible says in, in the book of Matthew and Jesus is preaching and teaching about the end times, right? Eschatology is preaching about the end times and he says this, as wickedness abound, the love of many will grow cold. As wickedness abounds, what does that mean? That wickedness is increasing every day today. But so is, here's the good news, so is the power of the Holy Spirit. So as evil is increasing, so is the power of God in his children. And that power is, can only be accessed from his throne. Fake fruit Christianity is not going to live. It's dead. Lukewarm Christianity is dead. You cannot fake it anymore. You could fake it to somebody that's not even in the spirit, but to God's children, you're going to see the glory on someone. Like, man, that, that person spent time with God. And you cannot fool somebody that spends time with the Lord daily. You can't fool somebody that spends time with God daily. And they saw these miracles. And I'm believing we're coming to a place where even doctors are going to be bringing the sick and the unhealed to the church, to the, to the people of God. I believe that they're going to ask for prayer because the doctor couldn't do anything. There is no natural remedy that's going to heal this person. It is only by the name of Jesus. Let me bring this to my pastor. Let me bring this person to my church. Let me bring these people so they can, they can experience the glory of God. I believe we're going right back to that in this generation. That's how more souls are going to be won because of the miracles that are going to be taking place. Revelation. Uh-oh, we're going to Revelation, y'all. Woo! Revelation chapter 2. Revelation scares the lukewarm. You guys can tweet that, right? Revelation will scare the lukewarm. But to the bold, the remnant, Revelation will only prepare us. God's word is here not to scare us, but to prepare us. That if nothing in this world satisfies, that if this world is coming to nothing and we serve a king that we're building for eternal, for glory, if we serve a king that is bigger, that is greater, a kingdom that we cannot see, amen. Now, the selfish ones would be like, I just want Jesus to come already. I'm ready. I'm sanctified. I'm whole. This world is too much right now. Like, I just want to be with Jesus, right? There's more souls that are called to come until all have heard until all have heard revelation chapter two let me just read this god bless you this is in verse one to the angel of the church of ephesus write these things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands i know your works your labor your patience and that you cannot bear those who are evil and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. That's a good saint right there, right? They're laboring, they're patient. They can't stand or bear evil, right? They've tested false teachers and, and people that are out there in the marketplace they, they've been preserved and patient and they've labored for the name of Jesus. But what is the one issue? Verse four, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. That you have left your first love. Love, love is what covers a multitude of sins, right? You could do all these things, Apostle Paul says in the book of Corinthians, but if you don't love, you're kind of like a 
sounding like a, a clanging brass, right? Like you just, you're just out here just, but, but if there's no love. But I think what, what God is teaching us here, the Lord is teaching us here is when we do anything, we have to acknowledge our first love. That we loved him because God first loved us. God wants us to put him first. This is how you're going to attract the anointing and purity and heart for God is keeping him first. Not what you've learned in your last church. Not what you've learned in, 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 in churchianity is what I call that. I'm talking about what, what Jesus and your encounters with him have taught you that love of God, that, oh, wretched man that I am, <laughs> Apostle Paul says, that the things that I want to do, I don't do, but the things that I shouldn't do, I do. Because the flesh is always warring against the Spirit. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You could do all the works. We don't preach a works-based salvation. That's not what we're talking about. I believe if you receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you have faith in him alone that salvation is on your, is on your life, that, that eternal life. But I'm talking about not wanting to do these things out of selfish ambition but really doing it for him. You know what I'm calling for? People that are not takers. Because what people do is they come to the church trying to take, take, take. When you're called to give, give, give. I'm here to serve a local ministry. I'm here to serve Jesus. I'm here to serve. When you study the book of Acts, we, our blueprint on building a church is not from a Facebook ad, right, on a study guide on how to build a church. Our revelation, our book, is our, our, our guide on how to build a healthy ministry comes from the book of Acts. That's how you build a local ministry. And here's the thing about it in the book of Acts. It came from real discipleship and it came in teams, in collaborations, in partnerships that you can't do this alone. A lot of lone wolves out there acting like wolves. But God is looking for sheep and assigned and ordained shepherds. For such a time as this. And I'm going to give you guys some keys on the anointing here. Let me close out on Revelation. Remember, therefore, from, from where you're, you have fallen, repent and do the first works. See, he's calling for repentance or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Verse 7, this is the word right here. He who has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Mm. Whew. We're not going to end in, in uh, Revelation. We're going to end in Psalm. Let's go to Psalm 119. And I'm going to give you guys four keys, four S's today. Truths about the anointing. Some truths about the anointing. Uh, Psalm 119 is where we're going to close out on this. The psalmist David. We started with David. We're ending with, with the psalms. We'll go to Psalm 119. And it'll, it'll be in verse 9. Okay. Yes, we open up our physical Bibles here. So you guys do have physical Bibles. You can always bring them. Uh, mine's falling apart, so. <laughs> uh, it can be falling apart, but it makes me set apart. Yeah. That's a whole word right there. <laughs> My life might be falling apart, but Jesus, you, I, I'm, I'm fixating on you because I'm set apart. Good things need to fall apart so better things can fall together. Truths about the anointing. Truths about the anointing. Number one, I'm going to give you guys four S's and I'm going to explain each one. The source. The source. I have to acknowledge that Jesus is the source of the anointing. Not Simon the sorcerer, okay? I rebuke act that, that Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 that tried to do witchcraft on, on that whole city. It says that these people got deceived by his sorcery and his witchcraft for a long time, the city of Samaria, from a sorcerer that also got baptized. So sorcerers can also get baptized and try to buy the anointing of God. He tried to buy the power of God. We talked about this in that series, okay? Truths about the anointing, you have to, you have to acknowledge the source, that the anointing is needed for you to operate at the level that God designed you to function at. Okay? That only Jesus can give you that anointing, that power. 
You can't fake it, and you got to marinate in his glory. I rebuke microwave Christianity, and I release into this atmosphere marinate Christianity, okay? I'd rather marinate in his presence, marinate. And that marination, y'all, might be healing, recovery. It might, it might take months. It might take years. But God can cleanse you right here, right now. You just got to decide. Marinate. The source. Second thing about the truths of the anointing, the submission. The submission. What does that mean? I'll give you guys an, uh, a really cool analogy about the submission. Like, you can be attractive, but your anointing requires somebody that matches your assignment. You can look good. You could be attractive. You could have all these accessories, bling, bling, right? Whatever you want. But my anointing matches somebody that can only match my assignment. Not only are we attracted to each other, we also carry assignments that are assigned by God with one another. That's a spiritual lens. The physical would only look at, wait, we're attracted physically. But the spiritual lens says, yeah, but we're also assigned to each other spiritually. Like you could be attractive, but your anointing needs to match your assignment. Does our assignments match one another? And this doesn't have to be marriage, y'all. This could also be partnerships and collaborations and friendships and prayer partners and prayer warriors. I'm talking about collaboration that is the new currency in the kingdom in this era. Healthy kingdom collaborations. The submission. To submit to one another in the fear of God is what the scriptures say. Submit to one another in the fear of God. Number three, truths about the anointing, the service. The service. Jesus didn't come to, to be served. He came to what? Serve. People come to church to be served. Serve my dysfunction. Serve this, serve that, serve that. Come to be released so you could be at service. Ministry is one word. It's service. It's service. God has blessed me and graced me with things that I am sacrificing to serve others. To serve others. And I'm willing to do that just to bless somebody else, even though I might not make money off it. Or in fact, I might even lose money. I might even lose resources to bless other people. But I'm willing because God put it in my heart. Sometimes you have to sacrifice something that might not be a gain. It might be a loss of your time, but it is a gain of a soul into the kingdom because of your service. I wrote something here. Many people would be much more anointed serving under a person's ministry, but they decided to sacrifice the anointing to branch off on their own without the grace of God upon their departure. Service also comes in teams. I know a lot of anointed men and women of God that would be best to be that leader, that pastor versus trying to be number one. That person, that person, I, I, me, I personally wouldn't. I'd rather be under somebody's covering. But there's people that are leaving and the grace of God isn't following them and the grace of God isn't on their departure. They are sacrificing the anointing that is what they're anointed for and marked for on their life just for what? Some clout? Some appraisal of man? Some praises of man? Or am I try, trying to be confirmed by God? Service is based on where I want to serve and who I'm called to serve with who I'm serving with the service truths about the anointing last one number four the sacrifice the sacrifice romans 12 1 what does apostle paul say i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you offer yourself a living sacrifice what is that living sacrifice it's us it's you boo for y'all that need to be delivered it's you boo boo right for those that need to be delivered. I got to be delivered daily, all right, y'all? So I'm not, I'm not better than anybody. So call me boo-boo at times because, you know, I get a boo-boo at times and I'm like, Lord. Anyways, thoughts that come. The sacrifice. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. What does that look like? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's what that living sacrifice is. It's you. And if we want to build godly altars or ungodly altars, it depends what the sacrifice on that altar is. 
in the, in the Old Testament, there was always a sacrifice that was needed. Thank God we don't have to go chase goats and, and bulls out there and sacrifice them on an altar. Man, some of us would be running, right? We get our runs in, our steps in by doing that every day. Thank God the ultimate sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, what Jesus did on the cross. Thank God for what he did on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice. So we become the living sacrifice to have a direct connection to the Father. The sacrifice, which is anointing, attracts attacks. So yes, attacks might come, you as the living sacrifice. The sacrifice that also my anointing is attached to an assignment. Yes, the sacrifice to be able to do the assignments that God has me. I know there's some people in here, y'all, you're a prayer warrior. You're called to intercede for this house. You're called to intercede for the politicians. You're called to intercede for the leadership. You're called to intercede for certain people. The sacrifice, the assignments, the anointing that attracts attacks, that is the sacrifice of what it takes, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, and my reasonable service. Psalm 119, closing out, verse 9. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. God's word cleanses us and our ways. Verse 10, with my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me no wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Verse 12, blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimony as much as in all the riches. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Precepts are his instructions, his commandments. I will delight, verse 16, myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. We need his word every day, whether it's one verse or a couple verses daily to meditate on. We need his word every day. And I'm here to standing before y'all that when you say yes to the Lord. <laughs> I've been through some interesting warfare in my life that I've never shared to a lot of people. That's why today I was talking about oil carriers. The anointing attracts the attacks. My, my testimony is uh, 2,190 days. 2,190 days. Alcohol and smoke free. Six years, this day, September 1st, 2018, this day, six years ago. That's a praise break right there. That's a praising the Lord. I was the age of 25 when I said, I'm taking the call on ministry on my life. From 20 to 25, every day, I'd be smoking every day if you knew me. I'd be hitting that vape, whatever it took, and that was my lifestyle. And I thought I was so addicted to that stuff. And because I was around the wrong people and the wrong things, and I thought that stuff fulfilled me. But saying yes to God, I didn't know that ministry was going to be like this. Who knew that saying yes to God, it would come with warfare, but would also come with a lot of joy, a lot of peace, a lot of releasing, a lot of false identities that I let go of, a lot of pursuing the things that the world continues to indoctrinate you with. You should go there. You should pursue this. You should get that title. You should get that degree. You should do this. You should be sent out. But it's like, what does God really want? And I remember taking that calling and I said, Lord, whatever it took. And these last few years have been a blessing. And I'll never forget my yes to him and the peace that just came upon my life when I actually said, yes, Lord. I'm going to cold turkey. I'm letting everything go. All the worldly. So I had to let go of worldly music too. I let go of it all. Everything. Just everything, everything, everything. And let me just tell you, those next couple months, major warfare in my life. Major temptation in my life. A lot of healing a lot of delusion that I got released from, a lot of bondages that I was going through. And let me just tell you, today, God is still checking my heart. So I never want people to think that God's done with us. He, he's not done with us. There's a purpose. But that, that pressing that produces God's promise through you because of the process he has to take you through. Whew. So much joy, so much peace. And I'm standing before you guys to just share, you know what? I never thought I'd be here, and I never asked for this. I thought I was just going to be an accountant with a business degree and just punching numbers. I didn't know I'd be sharing God's word, and that's the, that's the power of what God wants you to do. And I'm not saying everyone's going to be a pulpit preacher. What I'm sharing is God will position you where, where he needs to place you. 
that when kings and queens get into position, healing, restoration, the land, and that's what's so good about our God is every time you guys study the scripture, and I'll close out with this, God does not have a ear that is deaf, that he hears the cries of the righteous, that when you study scripture over and over and over and over again, God's people, the Israelites, back in those days, they'd fall short. They'd fall into sin. They'd go and worship other gods. They'd tear down the Lord's altars and then do, go worship other gods. But every time they repented, it did not. Their repentance and their cries and their troubles, those, those prayers when they cried out to God didn't lay on deaf ears that came from God. It laid on a hearing ear. That God can see your worship. God can see your heart. Don't forget your first love. That no matter the level of warfare on your life, I get it, you're a good steward. I get that you've been going through some stuff and you're like, Lord, why am I even going through this situation? That even in your trouble, the Bible says that he is a present help in a time of trouble. And I thank God for what he's got, got me through because I wouldn't be as mature spiritually today to be able to, to serve at this capacity. So where God has taken you, there is a level of sacrifice to get there. I'm praying that this be new season, new soil. I'm praying that the last eight months, God is going to do so much more in these next four months than he did in the last eight months. And for some of us, it's like, Lord, it didn't even look like you moved in those last eight months the way I wanted you to. But in these four months, he's going to show up like never before. That he could do more in half the time than in that full time in those eight months going into these next four months of this year. And if I'm believing prophetically that 2024 is the year of open doors prophetically, if I'm believing this, I'm also believing that there's doors that needed to close so that I can walk into new doors that are better. We're talking a lot about choices and decisions. I'm going to spill the beans or spill the glory here. These last going into the, 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 last, uh, the last part, going into the new year, we're going to be teaching on a, a collection called Destiny Decisions. Destiny Decisions. That we all have choices, but what we decide is where our destiny lies. And God will do what he needs to do to restore, and he'll make it even better. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. I'm calling forth.